last of the hour, so I think I'll get started. Um, first of all, I just wanted to introduce Dr. Abbas. Um, Dr. Abbas is joining us um, for, from Virginia Tech, where he's an assistant professor. Uh, his research focuses on uh, the epidemiology or epidemiologic and economic modeling of infectious diseases and um, at the interface of infectious disease system dynamics and public health systems research. So at Virginia Tech, he directs the uh, Disease and Health Systems Dynamics Lab, which focuses on understanding and analyzing um, an, an analysis of disease dynamics to improve the organization and financing of disease prevention and control programs being delivered by the health system. And I believe we're going to hear about some yeah. of those projects now. Awesome. Thank thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you for having me. And you can call me Kaja, that's my name. Actually, I don't have a last name. That's just for official purposes. That's actually my father's name. <laughs> okay. And okay, let's get started. So this particular study focuses on influenza modeling and primarily looking at the impact of different vaccination strategies that you can implement. And this is in the context of what if you had a pandemic influenza in Chicago. Okay. The current strategy among the ACPIP recommendations of CDC is that everyone above the age of six months and older can get the influenza vaccine. And we do have enough supplies for everyone who wants to get it even as of today. But the current vaccination coverage is roughly around 40% among the adults and it's around 60% among the children today. And the efficacy is around 40 to 60%. So we have the resources, but still the compliance and the efficacy is not that high enough. And here in this particular case, we're also looking at, in the context of a pandemic, the vaccine supplies may not actually get available within the first few months when the pandemic starts. So we have additional constraints. So there are three constraints. One with respect to coverage, one with respect to efficacy, the other one is delay in introduction of the vaccine. So when we implement a vaccination program, so let's say, for example, if I am infected with influenza, and if I spread it to Dr. May, basically what's going to happen is that she's going to potentially get it from me. It's a transmission. On the other hand, let's presume if I get vaccinated, and if I develop protective immunity, it's not only I develop protective immunity, I am also stopping the chain of transmission going from me to me, okay? So in this case, May is getting the indirect benefit while I'm getting the direct benefit of the vaccination, okay? So and this direct benefit is not only on the epidemiological aspect, but also as an economic aspect. If I'm healthy, then I'm able to, able to go and work and so forth. So there's a productive impact on this. And the same thing, it's not only the direct benefit for me, there's an indirect benefit in this case, both on the epidemiological front as well as on the economic front. So how, what happens during delays in vaccine introduction? How do you prioritize the vaccination groups among the different age groups, different risk groups, and how can you potentially quantify the benefit, both the direct benefit as well as the indirect benefit and hopefully to optimize the allocation of the limited resources that we have. So in this context, we are basically having in the context of Chicago, which has roughly around 9 million people there, what if an influenza pandemic occurs in this particular population? So we have basically 9 million individuals in Chicago, and what we have is basically a social contact network for those social behavioral dynamics. And for the disease transmission model, <coughs> it's based on the susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered model, epidemic model, okay? So it's a dynamic transmission model, and we are trying to use this model to estimate the spread of influenza in this particular population. So what we have up here is basically all the nine million people over a period of whole influenza season, where they come in contact, and when they come in contact, there's the risk of transmission if one of them is infectious, the other one is susceptible for a transmission to occur, okay? So the population dynamics is based on the census data and also transmission and the done and branched co-location data and so forth. So ultimately what it ends up the social contact network is we have a bipartite graph. In a bipartite graph, the left side is basically all the nodes, all the nine million people. On the right side is all the locations where they can potentially meet. At work, at home, at the play, wherever it may be, all the locations. And then what we have is basically a longitudinal dynamic social contact network that basically you run through it and whenever people come at the same location and if they're within six feet from each other and if one of them is infectious then we basically define it as an event where there's a risk of transmission 
that can take place to the susceptible in their immediate neighborhood. Okay? So, and it's all primarily based on the fundamental SIR model or the susceptible exposed infectious record hepatitis model. And in this particular case, we are constructing three different pandemic scenarios. The first one is a we refer to as catastrophic influenza, where 30% could potentially have be infected. So the attack rate is around 30%. The other one is strong influenza scenario, where the attack rate is around 20%, and the moderate around 10% attack rate. And with respect to the vaccine intervention compliance, we are looking at a rate of around 40% and efficacy of 40%. So when you play this thing out, so what we have is this three different epidemic scenarios. So this is without any vaccine intervention. So this is a catastrophic scenario, and this is the same vaccine epidemic scenario with the vaccine intervention. Okay? And here is a potential pandemic that can take place for the moderate scenario, and this is with the vaccination. And here's a scenario that can take place, the, the, the moderate influenza pandemic scenario without vaccination, and with vaccination there's hardly any epidemic taking place. So the potentials that are based on four, four health outcomes that you're finally defining. Basically, death, hospitalization, outpatient, and ill but not seeking medical care. And this study is actually based on a study that actually Martin Melzer, a former colleague of Dr. May, basically, at CDC has been conducting for the past 20 years or so. And the primary difference, the models that he runs on this particular model is that there he is able to quantify the static benefits or the direct benefits of vaccination. So in addition to that, we are incrementally computing also the indirect impact of this vaccination scenario. And the fourth primary health outcome that interest is on death, hospitalization, outpatient, ill not, not seeking medical care across these three different age groups, basically children, adults, and elderly, and also two different risk groups, the high risk group and the low risk group. And high risk groups are the people who are basically immunocompromised and are much more susceptible for influenza infection. Thereby, a person, depending upon the age group that they are in, and depending upon whether they are a low risk or high risk group, and the corresponding four health outcomes. So what we have in this decision tree is a probabilistic scenario of a particular case being in this experiencing these different scenarios based on the age group and risk group. And then it's the same thing that's getting repeated. So this is basically low risk group for children. This is high risk group for children. And here is the low risk group for adults, high risk group for adults. And then the corresponding four different health outcomes in each of those. And based on health outcome that each individual experiences, there's a corresponding, like the epidemiology impact is the four different health outcomes, and there's a corresponding cost associated with each of these scenarios. And with respect to these three different scenarios, the primary is the medical cost. But if there's going to be a death, there's also productivity loss. And also, if you're taking time off from work, there's also productivity loss. So that's also taken into account in computing these numbers. Okay? That by, so it's the same decision tree, but we are just playing out the exact numbers that are associated with these different health outcomes. Okay? So for example, in this case, if a death that can occur among the children, the corresponding loss among the lowest children will be roughly around $1.6 million. Okay, 25. The estimates for this is coming from cost of illness studies. It's slightly different from the cost of illness studies that EPA does. So the EPA, the way they do it is, around a few years back, it used to be around $9 million. Any person, or in essence like, a, what, what, what's your name? Your name. Your name. Carolyn. Carolyn? Carolyn. Carolyn. So how much does Carolyn cost? <laughs> how much are you willing to pay to make sure that Carolyn is healthy? A lot. <laughs> so Carolyn is willing to pay any amount of this thing. But potentially what EPA is going to do is quantify, for example, every US citizen, how much are ultimately willing to potentially pay in order for each life is roughly around $9 million. That is EPA estimates. And they will not differentiate irrespective of the age group. And what's your name? Alice. Alice. So in this case, Alice will be the EPA will say, both of you are costing $9 million. Okay, that's your price tag. Okay? <laughs> On the other hand, when you're doing this cost of illness studies, and let's presume that Carolyn is much say older than you, let's presume, you're actually going to... So when you do a cost of illness studies, we are going to look at how much of productivity lifespan that's left. So what we will do is we are going to keep the life expectancy similar for both of you, but we will actually estimate 
that you actually value more than Carolyn. Okay? Are you happy with that estimate? <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be based on at what age you are basically experiencing the different health outcomes and if there's any premature mortality at how many years of productive life is lost. Okay? Which is why you have different numbers for children, adults, and then elder people. Okay? But if you do it by the methods used by EPA, there will be no differentiation. It will be the same value. Irrespective of the age group, they will attach the same value. Okay? So, thereby, if you look at the pandemic cost, what I should say, for example, for each of those different health outcomes and different risk groups, there's a corresponding cost associated with it. Okay? So that's going to be the pandemic or the cost of the health outcome without any vaccine. With the vaccine, there's still going to be a corresponding cost for the different health outcomes and different age groups. But hopefully the proportion of people experiencing those health outcomes should be less. Or the, hopefully the people who are getting infected should be less with the vaccine intervention. But we also have a cost associated with the vaccine intervention. Okay, so that's going to be a total pandemic cost. And then pandemic cost per capita is if you divide by the total population. Okay, and then with respect to net benefits, what we do basically get it is we find the difference of the pandemic cost with the vaccine intervention and without the vaccine intervention. Okay, so that's going to be your net benefits. And then with the rest, to get the return on your investment, you're basically taking this number from net benefits and dividing by the cost that you put in into your vaccine intervention. So what you get is your return on investment. In essence, it's the number of dollars you can save by investing in vaccine intervention. And this has to be a positive number because nobody wants to invest on something and then, you know, you don't get that money back. Okay, so in essence, potentially your return on investment should be at least be one dollar or more for every one dollar investment that you're doing. If it is less than that, you don't want to do it. Can you think of any intervention where your return on investment is negative? Most medical. <laughs> Most medical. I mean, uh, it's a debatable. Uh, it's debatable. But for example, in the abstinence control programs in the United States, that's been found to be actually return on investment is actually negative actually spending money, you're actually losing money. Not only losing money, both on the economic aspect as well as on the epidemiological aspect. By implementing abstinence-only programs, both rate of teen pregnancies are going up, and the rate of sexually transmitted infections among teens are also going up. And there's a corresponding medical care associated to those, taking care of sexually transmitted infections and so forth. So we do have programs in this country right now for which actually return on I mean, it's, it's negative both on the epidemiological front as well as on the economic front, okay? But ideally, we should not implement any program that has a negative or even less than $1 return for every $1 that we invest, okay? So, here we are basically looking at the pandemic cost per capita for those three different influenza scenarios, and then here we are quantifying the benefit this is with the base model, in the sense no vaccine intervention. And this is with the static model, meaning quantifying only the direct benefits. If I get vaccinated, if I develop protective immunity, the benefit is only for me. And then in the case of the dynamic model, you're quantifying both the direct benefit as well as the indirect benefit. So stopping the secondary chain of transmission. Okay? So thereby, here what we do, what we should see and what we do see is that the dynamic model which quantifies both the direct an indirect benefit as actually a, the lowest pandemic, or yeah, the, basically here is the dynamic model as the lowest pandemic cost per capita, similarly with respect to attack rate, and similarly with respect to reproduction number. And the fact that we hardly saw an epidemic in the moderate scenario is primarily due to the fact that we, the reproduction number is almost close to one in the moderate scenario by implementing the vaccine intervention. Okay, so when you looked up here, here, this is the moderate pandemic scenario. This is the original epidemic, and by implementing the vaccine intervention, this hardly an epidemic. The reason being, the R naught is almost close to one. Okay, so in order for an outbreak to take place, your reproductive number has to be larger than one. Okay, and in essence, any time you try to implement an intervention, you want to make your reproduction number to be less than one, because as long as your intervention is able to make a reproduction number less than one, it will go towards elimination. We don't necessarily need to have it as a reproduction number of zero. That's for total eradication. 
anything less than one is fine. That will lead to elimination over a period of time. And then here, when you delineate the benefits from the direct impact and indirect impact, so in this, for in this particular scenario, this is the direct effect okay, of your intervention. So here's the return on investment, and here's the indirect effect. So in essence, this is your total return on investment. Up to here, the impact is because of your indirect benefit. Okay, so what we do see is actually your indirect benefit in this particular scenario is actually larger than your direct benefit. And this you'll see in scenarios where the vaccination coverage, overall effective vaccination coverage is low, your indirect benefits will be larger. For example, here the scenario is only 40% compliance, 40% efficacy. So your effective vaccination coverage is only around 16%. So in most of those scenarios, you'll find a larger indirect benefit. But if you, let's presume an extreme scenario, 100% vaccine coverage, 100% efficacy, almost all of it will be direct benefit. There'll be actually no indirect benefit in that particular scenario. Yeah. When you're talking about investment here, are you talking about the price of the vaccine or like the price of the vaccine plus whatever campaigns to try to, to get people to go into vaccinating? Like what is the investment that you're making? So in order to get the influenza vaccine shot, right from the start of manufacturing until you get it. Okay? okay. It's around $25 per person. Okay. It's, it's, it includes everything from start to the end delivery point. Okay? Which is why it's actually a little bit more than $25. And actually for Medicare reimbursement, until a few years before, they used to reimburse less than $25, which is where many doctors will don't want to do Medicare. They don't want to give flu shots to Medicare funder or Medicaid funded patients because uh, they actually lose money they actually getting the flu shots. Okay? But after conducting that particular study, basically they, actually it was done by a colleague at University of Rochester, and then they actually changed their pricing reimbursement rates after that. Okay? Okay. So this is your direct benefit, this is your indirect benefit, and this is your total benefit. Okay? And what we see is that as this pandemic scenario becomes more moderate, the impact of your indirect benefit becomes much more significant. And this is a, to explain this, this will come from the social contact network dynamics. The way to think about it is, in a more strong pandemic scenario, I'm likely to get infected not just by one person, I could likely to get infected from multiple people. Much more dense transmission. By implementing a vaccine intervention, you may be only cutting off some chains of this transmission, not all of it. On the other hand, if it is a much more sparser transmission network, a vaccine intervention is much more effective in cutting off those chains of transmission. Okay? Yeah? Could you talk a little bit more about where the data comes from for the dynamic models? So, yeah. you know, how do you know who people would infect and what their age groups are? And, you know, what is the, da the data yeah. behind yeah. that? So, so, in essence, what you have is an agent-based model where people are coming into contact just like us, like today. For example, today I'm coming in contact with potentially, say, with around 20, 25, 30 of you, like this. I mean, we, this is a special ad hoc scenario, but what we basically have is basically a case studies of where people are interacting with whom on a daily basis, which is, uh, nationally, which is nationally representative of the United States. So we have this particular data of who is coming in contact with whom. So we have this data. Uh, and it differs from weekdays to weekends. It differs from time of day, morning to evening, and so forth. So once we have this data, you can potentially build a social contact network in which you can run this agent-based model of where people come in contact with each other. So that is a social contact behavioral network. And once we have that, then we use the natural history of influenza. If one of them gets infected, what is the chance of transmission? the priority of transmission, and based on the virulence of the pathogen and so forth, and that's calibrated from past epidemics. So you, get, so you have two layers. One is your social viral contact layer, other is your epidemic transmission network. I wonder how much that changes from like Chicago to like rural Kansas and Minnesota and things like that. Ah, so yeah, so one is like we keep the same social transmission network, then we run it on different scenarios. So, so we do run it for New River Valley, which is a rural area in Virginia, and then you'll get different results. For example, some of the age groups that you see, there will be different in the attack rates in those different age groups, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
It's basically you have a heterogeneous social contact that which differs from place to place. So in essence, to decide vaccination priorities, if the supplies are limited, so what we find up here is if you look at the risk of death per 100,000, the risk of death is much higher among the high-risk groups, while it's relatively lower in the low-risk groups. Okay? But then, among the low-risk groups, the elderly are a much higher risk of death. Okay? So this quantifies the epidemiological impact. So in this case, you only want to prioritize your vaccine supplies among the high-risk groups, followed by the low risk elderly population. Okay? On the other hand, if you're going to look at return on investment, which captures both the epidemiological effectiveness and efficiency, both of them put together, then what we see is still the high risk groups, they have a higher return on investment, but then there's not much of a difference. The elderly are not necessarily need to be prioritized. And in fact, if you look at the numbers more carefully, the children will be almost the same as the elderly followed by the adults. Okay? Thereby, in this case, for prioritizing, you can prioritize the high-risk groups first, followed by both children and adults, no, children and elderly, then followed by the adults. Does this kind of make sense? So around 10, 15 years before, no, 15, almost nearly 15 years before, it was 2004 or around that time, vaccine supplies were limited for influenza. So at that time, the policy was the limited vaccine supplies will be given first to elderly first. So 65 above were prioritized first. Okay? And later on, some other studies that came out and said, no, 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 it's not the elderly. In fact, children should be prioritized first because children have a much more vibrant social contact network. So by actually targeting the vaccine supplies, you can stop the chain of transmission from children to other children, as well as children to their parents and grandparents in their households and so forth. So that was that particular study. And then the 2009 influenza pandemic, took place, and many models had different results, and ultimately the consensus was to basically prioritize at-risk population first, the high-risk groups, followed by no prioritization among the rest. And that's still the current policy which is in place. So what we kind of recommend is, if supplies are limited, high-risk groups first, which is fine, but followed with both elderly and children, rather than prioritizing either the elderly or just making it open for the whole general population. Okay. So when you apply the sensitivity analysis, say for example, at different compliance rates, that, the impact on attack rate. So compliance rate is also a measure of coverage rates. So the larger the coverage rate, the attack rates are lower in all those three different scenarios. Okay? And with respect to efficacy, again, as the efficacy of the vaccine increases, the impact on the attack rate becomes less. And the same thing with respect to vaccine start date, the earlier you start, the lower will be the impact on the epidemic, or the lower the attack rate. Or in essence, the moral of the story is higher the compliance, higher the efficacy, earlier the start date, the larger will be the impact on controlling the epidemic, or the lower will be the attack rate. Okay? When you look from the return on investment part, with respect to vaccine compliance, what we do see is that, let's consider this particular scenario, or let's consider this particular scenario. Your high return on investment is when the coverage is 10%. When you increase the coverage, your return on investment becomes smaller. Would you like to make a guess why? This is a favored scenario because it's high vaccine coverage, but your return on investment is lower compared to a smaller vaccine supply. Yeah? Actually, in all these scenarios, we don't. That's actually a very good point. But in this case, it's actually related to that as well, answer as well. But in this case, none of the scenarios we reach vaccination coverage where we have herd immunity, because we still have an epidemic that's taking place. Uh, but but it's good. But it's related to that in the sense, when we have the first set of vaccines, it is much more likely to stop the chain of transmission to a much wider network compared to spreading the vaccine to a lot of people. The secondary chain of transmissions will be that we cut off will be relatively less because the primary benefit itself is large. Uh, the way to think of it is like that: it's basically diminishing returns of marginal returns. Okay, the impact is much larger when you start it, and then over a period of time you're reaching a saturation point. 
Okay? But that being said, we still want to go for this particular scenario. Because here we are having a larger impact in lowering the attack rate while also having a positive return on investment. Okay? And with respect to efficacy, again, what we'll see is something similar to this. The larger the efficacy, the larger will be the return on investment. And that will hold true irrespective of any scenario. And here the reason why it's not seeing much of a return is here is because you already reach a scenario of here you attain herd immunity at this particular point, and then afterwards you hardly do not even increase the vaccination coverage beyond that. It's not going to necessarily lower the epidemic anymore because it's hardly an epidemic is taking place. The attack rate is almost close to 0% even at this particular scenario. So increasing vaccination coverage beyond that will not have much of an impact because you already have herd immunity. Okay. And with respect to vaccine start date, the earlier you start, the larger will be your return on investment. Okay. And we see the similar set of benefits, whether irrespective, whether you quantify both the direct and indirect benefits, like in the dynamic model, or only look at the direct benefit using the static model, either way it holds good. Okay? But here you're able to delineate and say how much is due to the direct impact and how much is due to the indirect impact. Okay? So thereby, your static model, like your vaccine intervention is actually a positive return on investment. Okay? Whether you use both the static model or the dynamic model. And then by using the dynamic model, by quantifying both the direct and indirect benefits, what you're able to see is a higher return on investment. How many of you agree to this result? That we see a vaccine return as a positive return, of vaccine intervention as a positive return on investment. As a show of hands. All of you are health oriented, want to be politically correct. Okay. How many of you disagree with this? Nobody wants to be politically incorrect. <laughs> and the ones who didn't raise their hands, they are diplomats. Okay? <laughs> this is how we do it, and this is how most people do it, and this is how we interpret it. But there's uh, room for scope like for additional research in this area, because here you're looking at one vaccine, one season, and you're quantifying the benefit. But in the case of influenza, we're here giving the vaccine multiple seasons. For example, if we avert a death from a vaccine intervention this year, and we avert a death, the same person say, if I, my premature mortality is protected because of the vaccine this year, fine. So I say the vaccine is a positive return on investment for this year. Next year, again I get the vaccine, and again I say, my risk of mortality is reduced. I say I have a positive return on investment, but we are double counting the benefits. Because mortality is still one case averted, one death averted, but I'm double counting the benefits. Does this make sense? So there's a scope for this type of research to do actually. When you're doing a vaccine, that's having a shared benefits over a period of time. And this is not only true in the case of influenza vaccine where we give multiple seasons, but it's also true when you look at a whole set of vaccines. If you look at all pediatric vaccines, what we do is analysis that we say is we have positive return on investment for each vaccine, like measles vaccine, mumps vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, and so on and so forth. But what we really want to know is what is the shared impact of all of those vaccines, of all the pediatric vaccines, which, uh, to my knowledge, there are no studies that looks into that part, and that's a scope of research to do those type of studies. So what we see out here is a kind of an overestimate of the benefit, and but vaccines, in essence, most of the times we do believe it has a value. But in order to get a more precise estimate, we should look at, like double counting the benefits should be accounted for. Okay? Okay. So with respect to the priorities, if vaccine groups, if vaccine supplies are limited, we, if you only look at the epidemiological impact risk of death, then you prioritize the higher risk groups followed by the seniors. But if you're accounting for both the epidemiological and economic impact, you can prioritize high risk groups followed by the children and seniors. Okay. And with respect to the limitations, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, what, what's a realistic time frame for when a pandemic vaccine can be started and where would that fall into your model? So, it takes a while. Yes. So the current estimate is like, 
the estimate we have is we, or it may take even up to six months from the start of the epidemic before a vaccine gets implemented. On the other hand, if you are trying to understand seasonal epidemic influenza, right now the supplies are available right at the start of the epidemic. But that's the kind of trade-off. But that being said, even after six months, we may not get an effective vaccine. Yeah. So that would fall down in the lower return on investment? Uh, ah, so that's a good point. So here we are only looking at the biomedical intervention of vaccination. But especially during a pandemic, then what happens is that we cannot just wait for the vaccine and then let the epidemic just prevail. We'll also put a lot of significance on the social behavior interventions, like you know, closing schools, trying to limit our social contacts, quarantine, isolation, mm -hmm. and so forth. So in essence, both are important transmission dynamics. Actually, there are three important drivers. So one is the social behavior dynamics. So that, that will take a significance until the vaccine becomes available. But if you do have a vaccine and also antivirals are available, then that, that's a biomedical intervention. And the third driver is the environmental dynamics. Temperature, humidity, those things also matter. And with respect to environment dynamics, that will help us to understand why we have differential outcomes in different regions, but we cannot necessarily change the environment in a particular region as an intervention. But that will try to understand how the progression is taking place in different places. Yeah. So actually, when these models were run, we didn't change the social behavior dynamics before the start of the epidemic to what happens at the start of the epidemic. But the kind of simulations that we are currently running, so we conducted like a nationally representative survey of how people change behavior once an epidemic starts. Yeah. So we are incorporating those results in the newer set of simulations yeah. to understand the differential health outcomes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then some of the cost, the cost that's actually the government uses for doing implementation plan. That's not included in this particular scenario. And if you do include it, then potentially we can understand this analysis from a societal perspective. So right now the perspective is from the medical and productivity perspective. Okay. Okay. So in this particular study, we looked at a fungal meningitis outbreak. Are you guys aware of this outbreak? Have you ever even heard of fungal meningitis? It's a very rare pathogen. Yeah. And, and potentially the last, this was an outbreak that took place in 2012, but <coughs> until then, there was hardly any cases in the US. The last set of cases before that was in 1960s. And this particular outbreak took place primarily because of a contamination of an epidural spinal injection that was actually passed on to several states, and the epidemic basically started around, for around six months in 2012 that it took place. So from this facility in Massachusetts, Basically, it was shipped to 23 states, of which 20 states actually had cases by receiving this epidural spinal contaminated injections. And there are, nationally, there are around 751 cases and 64 deaths. In the case of Virginia, around 54 cases and five deaths. And here we are looking at specifically from the local health department. So this is where I'm currently located in New River Valley. What is the impact of this localized outbreak response? When I say it's localized, it's still in collaboration with other partners, including hospitals, state health department, and CDC. Okay? So what happens is that if a patient has been administered a contaminated injection, they are followed up every two weeks. And there are two facilities, and they are followed up every two weeks, and if they experienced any of those symptoms, and basically the symptoms are similar to the same that of bacterial meningitis. You get swelling, pain, and so forth, and ultimately it can have a neurological effect affecting you like leading to swelling of your brain, okay? And if not treated, it will lead to fatality, almost 100% fatality, okay? So the patients were continually, basically, are like monitored, surveillanced, and then if any of them were experiencing symptoms, they are immediately sent to provide clinical care, hospitalization as needed, and then until there are no more cases. Okay, so this went on for around six months. So the investigation is very similar to a football disease outbreak. You have a single source contamination, went to a lot of different states, you trace them, and then you conduct the investigation, okay? So thereby here you're looking at how, what is the cost of the local health department perspective. Right there, the localized cost was roughly around $30,000 that they spent for two, basically in surveillance and control of this particular outbreak. 
And then the clinical cost for the folks that needed clinical care, hospitalization and so forth, is roughly around <coughs> $39,000. So in essence, altogether, how many cases were potentially averted? There's roughly around eight cases were averted by doing this particular outbreak response. Thereby, when you look at, say, for example, compared to the scenario of doing this outbreak response, compared to not doing anything from the outbreak response, what is the impact? Both on the epidemiological front, number of cases averted, and how much, how much did it cost to do this particular outbreak response? So in essence, the total cost is roughly around $70,000, and roughly around 153 tallies are averted, thereby the incremental cost of the ratio is roughly around $460 per tally averted. Okay? So that's how we quantify the response from the local health department around $200 per tally averted, from the clinical aspect around $260 per tally averted, so altogether $460 per tally averted. Okay? So this is the first time in the local health department in New River Valley where they were able to quantify the epidemiological impact and economic impact of any program that they've implemented. Because most programs today that's implemented in the local health department today, primarily it's focused on communicable disease control and environmental monitoring. And, and most programs do not understand, I mean not understand per se, we really do not quantify the epidemiological impact and we definitely don't quantify the economic impact of the intervention. And most programs that came into place because of outbreaks that took place 100 years before, 150 years before, and they became institutionalized. And it's continuing over and over and over again, while the burden of disease has completely transformed, especially the United States, from primarily being an infectious disease predominance, primarily the focus is now at the larger burden of disease on non-communicable chronic conditions. But still, the local health department budget is primarily for communicable disease control and environmental health monitoring. And the only programs that they do implement on non-communicable chronic conditions is due to special grants or funds, but it's not part of their regular mandate, okay? And here comes the fun part, not fun part. Actually, there are no cases. So the kind of cases that we say that are averted was actually a proxy measure by using what is averted at the state level and then used as a sub-measure of it. But if you really look at it, how much was actually averted, there are no cases that were actually averted. Does this make sense? And, and other limitation, there's really, we don't have a disability weight estimation for fungal meningitis. So we use the measure for bacterial meningitis because the symptoms are similar as a proxy measure. Okay? And then by using a metric like dollars per daily averted, and if you can do this for multiple programs, then the local health department will be able to quantify the impact, both the epidemiological impact and the economic impact of their programs, which currently, to my knowledge, no health department in this country has this metric for any most programs, actually. Uh, in fact, the first person, actually, who was hired as a health economist of the local health department was in Los Angeles a few years before, and they had to create a new position title because that title doesn't even exist in local health department. Okay? And that's the first set of things that's done in the local health department. There's a little bit done in the state health department, primarily driven for very specific projects, and there's a group that does it at the CDC, but mostly for federal projects. Okay? But if you do have it, then we can quantify the benefit across several programs in the health sector. And the last study we here you're looking at is trying to understand the impact of two different therapies. One is called the expedited partner therapy, which is actually implemented in Colorado, wherein if if say I'm diagnosed with, say, for example, with a sexually transmitted like chlamydia gonorrhea, not only I am prescribed antibiotics, I'm also prescribed antibiotics to give to my sex partners. While in the case of Virginia, the antibiotics are prescribed only for me, but not to my sex partners. They have to actually go and report to the clinical care provider directly to get their antimicrobials. The reason being, by prescribing antibiotics without seeing the patient directly, there's a risk of antibacterial resistance, so forth. So the current legal law does not allow in Virginia, while the law does allow in the case of Colorado. In Colorado, as well as 40 other states, it's not permitted. But in Virginia and six other states still, it's not allowed. Okay. So in this particular, so right now, chlamydia and gonorrhea, they are the primary major like sexually transmitted infections in the United States. Like especially chlamydia and gonorrhea, they account for more than two million cases every year. Okay, and then of course left untreated. There's a larger risk of clinical care or risk of 
like a pelvic inflammatory disease and corresponding complications associated with it. And it's costing roughly around $16 billion annually with respect to treatment of sexually transmitted diseases. And then to prevent, to do effective treatment, we should not only treat the index patient, but it'd be also good to treat the, all the partners, so basically the sexual contact network. That way we can basically prevent reinfection rates. Okay? Thereby, if there's an index patient, this particular, who was originally susceptible, can become infected from their partner. Okay? So if they are getting treated and cured, but if the partner is not getting treated and cured, there's again risk of reinfection. Okay? So in essence, the way the, the current system works in Florida is not only this person gets treated, they immediately provide medication to, to the index patient to actually give to the partners, and they are also treated. But the way it's done in Virginia is only this person will get treated. And to get antibiotics for the partners, they have to report directly to the clinical care provider. And many a times, the index patient will not even let their partners know about this infection. Okay? So these are the two therapies that's referred to. So the standard partner referral as practiced in Virginia, and the expedited partner therapy as practiced in Colorado. Okay? So we are comparing these two different scenarios and what would be the corresponding impact, both on the epidemiological front and the economic front. So what we have is, again, should we go for the standard partner therapy or should we go for expedited partner therapy? What happens to the impact not only on the index patient, but also on their partners and the corresponding reinfection rates and so forth. So the data from, for this specifically comes from a clinical trial that was conducted in Washington state. Okay, so we use that as a measure and then we adapt, you can adapt it to each state, corresponding numbers and so forth. Thereby, you add the both the numbers, epidemiological impact and the economic impact, and what we get out here is what is the potential, how much it's going to cost, and how much it will be effectiveness of this particular measure. This is a little bit difficult to read because both of them are on the same plot, like expedited partner therapy to standard partner referral, but when you look at it from here, basically now averaged out, what we see that is, here's the expedited partner therapy, it costs less and has with respect to health loss, is also less. Here's your standard partner referral that costs more, and your health loss is also more. And this is true whether the index patient is a male or a female. Okay? And then if you compare it, so in essence, here's your current program, which is standard partner therapy, and this is a program if you implement expedited partner therapy. What we say is it's going to actually cost less, and it's going to have a positive health impact almost most of the time. When you look at the whole uncertainty like metric, what we have is a cost saving program. By implementing expedited partner therapy or standard partner referral, you'll actually save money and also have better health outcomes. So Colorado made the smart decision of making the change from standard partner, which used to be there, to expedited partner therapy. But we in Virginia are not that smart. So we still have the standard partner referral as a program. And why do you think that's the case? So we have a program that has a positive health benefit and it's going to cost you less compared to what you're doing today. So why are you not implementing it? Social practice. The one is social practice. Current legal framework does not allow. And many a times, in order to, this is the current law. Antibiotics cannot be prescribed without seeing the patient directly. This, I mean, this evidence is currently going in the legislature discussions and so forth, but nobody discusses this as a separate program. It goes as a part of several things, goes on, and depends upon all the several things, whether the party in power and so forth are in favor of it. I, so that is how things get passed, yeah. Well, this doesn't incorporate like the potential downstream cost of in, increased antibiotic resistance, potentially. Ah, that's a like good point. That's a good point. But so far, the community trials that has been conducted, we haven't seen a rise in resistance because of implementing this program so far. I guess it's a small number, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, question? OK. OK, so thereby, this program is cost saving for both, either the index patient is a male or a female. It's actually a cost saving program. In essence, we are having it up here. It's a cost saving program. It's going to cost less and it's going to have higher effectiveness. So normally we should readily adopt it. 
but then there are so many other factors that are actually going to place before you adopt it. So not only the epidemiological impact, not only the economic impact, but also social impact, the technological factors, some of the environmental factors, politics, security, legality, all of these things will have to play into place in order to make it happen. What are the limitations is, it's not a truly static model, nor is it a truly dynamic model, because we only looked at one partner. We didn't look at the concurrent partners, nor did we look at multiple reinfections. We only looked at one reinfection. Okay, so that's all the data we had from the community trial, so we could pick it that, but ideally we should have a much more dynamic model looking at all the social contact network, it has been concurrent partners and reinfections as well. And the evaluation was done from the healthcare perspective in this particular scenario, okay? So in essence, we had three different studies that we looked at. So the first one was focused on influenza, trying to impact, understand the impact of vaccination during an influenza pandemic, and here we basically quantified the benefit if you use return on investment, and basically number of dollars saved for every one dollar that you invest. And if you have this metric or any cost benefit analysis, and using a return on investment measure, this can be used to prioritize programs not only within the health sector, but across multiple sectors, whether it's health, education, transportation, and so on and so forth. Okay? On the other hand, the second study, basically fungal meningitis, quantified the benefit in the form of dollars per daily avatar. Okay? That can be used as a measure for prioritizing programs only within the health sector, but across different diseases and conditions. Okay? On the other hand, similar to third study is also dollars per quality gained. You can use it as a metric for comparative measure across different diseases and programs. So in essence, even there are three different diseases. If you look at only this particular, these two studies, it's a kind of an objective comparison of the epidemiological and economic impact. Because here it was dollars per daily averted, which is similar to dollars per quality gained. And here again, dollars per quality gained, okay? And here, even that health benefit was basically converted to dollars. So basically you're able to get a return on investment measure of how, much, how many dollars are saved for every one dollar invest. That way this metric can be used as a comparison not only for within the health sector, but across multiple sectors, okay? So why are we doing this? So in essence, somebody could have walked out, so what? Okay, so why should we even do this? So in essence, we want to implement the most cost-effective intervention because our resources are primarily limited, and for many times we should have a good understanding of the burden of disease, and also what is the impact of our intervention on those burden of disease. Thereby, by using these models, we can direct our investments towards the more cost-effective interventions, and thereby towards implementation, institutionalization, and hopefully the largest impact on the burden of disease. So that is why we want to do this, okay? How many of you work in the local health department here? How many of you worked in the state health department? Yes. So do you know the impact of the programs that you implement in the state health department? No. <laughs> <laughs> we want to change it in the near future, not in the near future, at least sometime in the future. But in general, I think it's a hard thing to monitor. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, like I had this conversation, with, actually there's a new recruiter at Virginia Department of Health, and he was actually mandated to understand the impact of these programs. And we had this conversation, and I was interested in measuring the impact of health programs as dollars per daily avatar or dollars per quality gain. And he was really insistent, no, 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 we should use the return on investment. Dollars per, save per every dollar of investment. Because he said he goes to the legislature, he has to present not just the health programs, but across all programs are getting presented. Education, transportation, infrastructure, sanitation, all kind of programs are presented, and everybody presents a measure of return on investment. And this type of calculation is very prominent and widely used in most sectors, except for the health sector. And, and health sector primarily <coughs> presents this as diabetes prevention program, obesity prevention program. And many times it's very difficult to compare a diabetes to obesity prevention program because these are two different health and disease conditions. Okay? And so potentially if you can quantify the benefit as a burden of disease, if you can comparable, either daily severed or quality is gained, and of course, if you can even convert the overall health benefit to the corresponding economic impact and so forth, then we can use this as a prioritization created not only within the health sector, but across all different sectors. Okay? And, yes? That 
That's a very valid question. So that's a, that's a very valid question. So here, we didn't use a time frame. Like in a sense, like a, it could be anywhere in the future. But many a times when budget decisions are made, they're more interested in the short-term impact. So not only we should do this economic cost benefit or cost effect in analysis, but also do budget impact analysis, which will actually look at the specific impact within a very short time frame in the next year, next three years, next five years, because that is going to drive the decision that you want to make today. So in essence, like cost effect analysis is much more valuable if it is also combined with the budget impact analysis within a defined time frame, next three years. Normally it's three to five years. Anything beyond five years, at least the person in power today is not interested in what's happening five years later, okay? So I'll the collaborators and the funding, and thank you very much. That's actually not only in the case of a pandemic, even in the regular scenario, not only for influenza, but even other vaccines, uh, it's getting more prominent in this country, or especially this country and as well as many Western European countries because of the vaccine hesitancy issue. So there's no more availability of the resources, nor the awareness that vaccine is beneficial per se. There's a larger, what do you say, kind of growing trend uh, of a negative vaccine sentiment, right. like people choosing not to vaccinate. Uh, so far, no, we haven't uh, looked into that aspect at all. Uh, the closest we have, as a, there's a theory behind this, it's called the Philipson model. The idea is when you have larger number of cases occurring in a community, people will go and take the corresponding intervention with the vaccination or anything, but as the disease cases recede, they will revert back to the normal behavior. But what we are seeing in the US is like, since most of them do not see any infectious diseases happening directly, Many of them are actually opting for the children not to get vaccinated. Right. So we have the kind of a growing, almost like a diffusion of non-protective behavior happening. And so far it doesn't, and in fact, we conducted one study to understand what is what drives the positive vaccine sentiment and negative vaccine sentiment, and use like social media trends to understand what happens. So the way the positive vaccine sentiment derives is these are folks who derive the information from uh, like a scientific sources like CDC or health departments or your doctors and so on who tell that vaccines are beneficial and they're likely to take it. So what drives a negative vaccine sentiment is they actually do not even talk anything about the vaccine. They basically build a distrust of the scientific agencies. You build a distrust of CDC, FDA or your health department and so forth and that's it. You don't even say vaccine is non-beneficial or anything. Once you build that distrust, people no more believe in that. No more, no more believe in the whatever press releases or news trends that CDC or other agencies are releasing. And that drives the vaccine hesitancy. And then, of course, they use ad hoc stories, like uh, coincidence stories where after vaccine, somebody falls sick and so on and so forth. But none has been actually proven by the vaccine adverse emergency event report system. But these small, small news snippets drive this vaccine hesitancy behavior. You know, we haven't uh, incorporated that. Uh, awareness or alertness into the issue. What was the name of the theory uh, The Philipson model. Thank you. Philipson model, is, that is what happens when the cases are high, people are much more likely to take a protective behavior. And then as the cases go down, people don't need to, they're not concerned about it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Well, I, was, I was thinking the same thing, and I was thinking that you could build in, in an agent-based stochastic simulation different behavioral theories within agents oh. too, right? Like you could say, we're going to predict or we're going to simulate what would happen if this percent of the population or whatever had 
disbelief about vaccination, as well as like how they interacted with other agents, uh -huh. like with the model. Which which um software did you did you develop your own software? For it's that? like one is the the base agent based modeling that has been done for now is like for more than twenty years. I mean the original software actually it's a group that was based in Los Alamos. And around 10 years, 10, nearly 15 years, we got half of the group. It was led by Stephen Eubank, who moved to Virginia Tech, and used the same simulation platform. And then the disease transmission model, you run it on top of it. You, you have a GUI interface to run these models, as well as you can do it on, like, on the code. It's like based on C++, but you can write some scripts and so forth, and you can run on top of it. And the, and the analysis later on is either R or Python you use for additional analysis. Yeah. So, I was, I was glad that you brought up the issue of, um, of uh, you know, the counting or double counting effects uh -huh. and benefits of, over time. Uh, because there are some times where even in vaccines, uh, cost effective and cost benefit analysis have been counterproductive to the adoption of vaccines. Uh -huh. And, you know, vaccines, of course, have become a little more expensive as time goes by and, and the, the limit, there's a limitation in terms of the benefit. But, so can you speak a little bit about those limitations and you know and the potential of bringing into the model or into the issue uh, what we will call uh, the social impact or whatever I mean the, the benefit to society that is not necessarily quantifiable through cost and benefit or cost uh, risk. Ah, so this is like you're looking at the impact on uh, like improvement of so human capital and so forth. Correct. Yeah. Right. So that's the newer. Uh, Trend that is going on, like basically, not new. I mean, it has been there for a while, but you now the push is not only just push on the economic benefits per se. Like in essence, if you keep people healthy, or especially children healthy, it's not just regular productivity. Actually, they'll have much better cognitive ability and so forth. So that'll be it'll lead to much more enhancement for innovation, creativity, and so forth. So that's another way to drive why we want to promote healthy programs, whether so vaccination or sanitation or other programs. It's not a just simple economic productivity as of today, but it can actually lead to much more better creative, innovative society and so forth. So that is one thing. And that other one is another limitation of the cost benefit and a cost analysis. Many times it doesn't go along with the budget impact analysis. And without the budget impact analysis, for example, HPV vaccination, most of the vaccination that's been done today, we will not see any benefits up to 20 to 30 years later from today. Uh, but the cost effect analysis does take, I mean, looks at the whole timeline and says dollars per daily. But most of the dailies averted are 20 to 30 years from today. So the budget impact analysis will almost quantify and tell you what is the immediate benefit in the next three to five years. So that will also go into decision making process rather than. So normally, cost effect analysis is much more valuable along with the budget impact analysis. And the growing trend is not only just looking at the economic impact. But also showing the larger impact with respect to human capital and so forth. Yeah. And that's my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, we're just at the hour, so we should let people go. Thank okay. you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. 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 Hey, man. It's a nice to meet you in person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see you again at four. Man, nice stop. Thank you. I just want to say nice talk. <laughs>